We're ready for Job 13. Job 13. And I'm, I'm using the New King James this morning on this. Well, I usually do on this, this section. All right, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we bless you for giving the Lord Jesus Christ, and we would, as your people, submit and honor and rejoice in Jesus as Lord. And we know that this is not a static thing, it's a day by day, moment by moment, uh, yielding, submitting, honoring you, saying yes. And may that be the theme of our day and days ahead to honor you, to worship you, to serve you, to surrender day by day. And Father, as we look into the book of Job again, we ask for the Holy Spirit to be our master teacher, to help us to find a valid application and understanding from your word. And we give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Job is in the process of rebuking his comforters. And he continues to be uh, pretty straightforward. And in this chapter also, he is wanting to have an audience with God. And that will come soon enough. And great transformation happens. So again, verse, the first 12 verses, we'll read them and then make a few comments as we go along. Behold, my eye has seen all this. My ear has heard and understood it. What you know, I also know, I am not inferior to you. But I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. But you, forgers of lies, you are all worthless physicians. Oh, that you would be silent, and it would be your wisdom. Now hear my reasoning, and heed to the pleadings of my lips. Will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for him? Will you show partiality for him? Will you contend for God? Will you be well when he searches you out? Or can you mock him as one mocks a man? He will surely rebuke you if you secretly show partiality. Will not his excellence make you afraid and the dread of him fall upon you? Your platitudes are proverbs of ashes. Your defenses are defenses of clay. I think he's pretty straightforward. One of the things that the more I study the book, I'm convinced that uh, we don't want to fall into the trap of either Job or his friends of being overly dogmatic about the other. Uh, and yes, Job is more in sync and in the right direction than his friends. But again, there's a, ho there's a whole lot we don't know. And so um, I've, I'm thinking more in terms of we, t we, t we look at this, we try to understand what is being said, but in making judgments, personally, I'm not making strong judgments about him I'm looking for ways of things that we should avoid, not only from him, but also from his friends. So, um, he's just very forthright. He's, he could be offended. We certainly can get offended. You think I'm so ignorant. I know everything you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, we may not say that, but sometimes when someone is trying to give us an exhortation, you know what we're simultaneously doing? We're thinking of all the things that they could be exhorted about. It's very hard to, to receive exhortation, especially if it's from someone that you think is a little bit lower than you. And that may just be the person that God wants to give me an exhortation. So I need to be careful. Uh, the person giving the exhortation uh, doesn't necessarily have to be uh, the greatest Christian that ever lived. God may want to give a word through whoever he chooses. So he wants to talk to God, and that's going to take place later on in the book. 
Uh, he wants to reason with God. He can't make any sense of his situation. And then added to that, of course, his friends are insisting that the problem is very easy to see. You've got sin. So <clears throat> when, when we're in a deep rut of whatever, uh, and we respond, the temptation is to respond. I'm not, I'm not accusing Job of this. I'm just saying that many times we will respond, we will overreact, we will get discouraged, uh, we will go and tell someone how so-and-so does not understand us and how they've hurt our feelings. And uh, that doesn't help anything. Uh, the other person does not cause my wrong response. Again, I'm not saying Job is responding wrong. I'm just saying we often do. And if I have a wrong response, uh, that's on my plate, and I need to own responsibility for it. Again, he's very forthright. He says, you're forgers of lies. You're all worthless physicians. That's pretty strong language. Uh, just looking from where I sit, uh, I think it would be safer for me to say, uh, it's certainly in my spirit, I may say, well, this person who's giving me counsel is wrong. Uh, but you know, they could have been right, but for the grace of God, I could have done everything they've said I've done or be where they say I am. So we need to be careful. And one thing to keep in mind as we go through this, for as godly a man as Job was, he's still not our model. And so on one level, we can look at him responding to all of this, and probably I think most of us would say, or all of us would say, he sure did better than I would have done. But if, if you're in a hard time and you're using Job as your model, you might want to justify saying some things that maybe you shouldn't say. Who is our model? Jesus, Jesus is our model. Tempted and tested in all points as we, yet without sin. And we are told specifically in Hebrews 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We are to look unto Jesus. We can glean a lot of good things from Abraham and Joseph and Job and, and so many more. The great cloud of witnesses. Um, but we, we look unto Jesus. So in verse 5 through 7, uh, he, uh, he's saying that they're wickedly uh, speaking for God. He has a confidence that, they're, that what their foundation is wrong, and by the grace of God, we talked about this either last week or the week before, his he has a conscience clear before God. He knows, it's not arrogance, he knows that he's not guilty of what they're saying. And, uh, but they're acting, they're acting as if they're lawyers on God's behalf. Uh, but if you're a lawyer on God's behalf and you're not speaking the truth, why were they not speaking the truth? They didn't know the truth. Uh, again, we need to be careful about how we accuse somebody else. We may look at how they're responding to something and whisper to ourselves or tell someone, you know, you need to pray for so-and-so. He's not responding very good. Well, if we knew the whole scope, we might say, you know, uh, Sam needs prayer, but I'll tell you, if it was me, I'd need a lot more prayer. Uh, always assume that the other person with what's on their plate is probably doing better than you would if you, it was on your plate. The place of humility is always a good place to be. And he asks a good, good, good question uh, in verse 9, 
will it be well for you when God searches you out? We have to remember that, that we'll all stand and give an account. He will surely rebuke you if you, verse 10, show, if you secretly show partiality. Now, who, who do you think these friends were showing partiality to or toward? themselves they are it seems clear to me that they are assuming that they're up on this high and holy hill and either immune or better than job and in in the arguments that we have with people and the conflict we have with people is it not pretty common for us to assume the superior position <laughs> and then the other person is assuming the superior position and then we throw darts at each other and wonder why there's no peace. So, we have limited knowledge. And uh, the truth of the matter is they were being unjust toward Job. And, but they didn't know it. I, I believe that they were sincere. I don't think that they had got together and, and, and said, uh, how can we hurt Job? Or how can we um, bombard him with a bunch of lies? I think that they were sincere, and, but they were wrong. All right, verse 13 through 19. Uh, Hold your peace with me. Let me speak. Then let come on me what may. Why do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hands? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so will I defend my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation. For a hypocrite could not come before him. Listen carefully to my speech and to my declaration with your ears. See, now I have prepared my case, and I know I shall be vindicated. Who is he that will contend with me? I now... If, if now I hold my tongue, I perish. Well, again, I think for the everyday person, this is arrogance uh, or something. But for Job, here's the agony of the soul of a man who, by the grace of God, his conscience is clear. He's not, a, he's not aware of anything he's done or said that would precipitate his condition. So he wants to speak. And the evidence here is that his friends kept trying to interrupt him and give their own words. And so he demanded, he's demanding a right to keep talking. And he makes this wonderful confession right in the middle of all this. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And we see this in Job all along. He didn't understand what was going on. He felt like God was against him. He says that over and over again. And yet at the same time, I trust him. Though he slay me, I'll trust him. So what is an important thing that we learn here? And we know this about ourselves. We can, we can be in our mind and thinking, we can be poles apart in our thoughts. On the one hand, questioning God, doubting God, on the other hand, tenaciously trusting him. And, and yes, the Bible says a man who, a, a divided heart, a man with a divided heart is unstable in all of his ways. And I don't know that I'm going to accuse Job of having a divided heart. I don't the context of that, I think, is a little bit different. If I have a divided heart in the sense of I'm, I'm feeding the flesh, trying to feed the spirit, then that's definitely a situation where I'm not going to receive things from the Lord. But even in a spiritual agony like Job is going through, if I'm not careful, uh, I can get in a situation that's going to tumble down into some more serious things. But Job is tenacious about holding fast to a solid confession of faith. 
Spurgeon had some good words here that I'd like to share with you. It is well worth an observation that in these words, Job answered both the accusations of Satan and the charges of his friends. Though I do not know that Job was aware that the devil had said, does Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not set a hedge about him and all that he hath? Yet Job answered that base suggestion in the ablest possible manner, for he did it, for he did in effect say, though God should pull down my hedge and lay me bare as a wilderness itself, yet will I cling to him in firmest faith. So there are three things here in this text. A terrible supposition, though he slay me. A noble resolution, yet I will trust him. And a secret appropriateness. There is a great appropriateness in our trusting God while he is slaying us. The two don't seem to go together. So Spurgeon listed several reasons why he thought slaying times were good times. Such times show us that we are really God's sons and daughters because he only chastens his children. Uh, you know, you might say, well, Lord, I wish you'd pay me a little, li little bit less attention. <laughs> uh, we can understand that, especially when it just goes on and on and on. But be encouraged if, if God is paying you some attention. Some people will say to the last letter of the churches in the Revelation, uh, that some say, well, the Laodicean church, none of them were saved. Well, whom he loves, he chastens. And he, he even says that in that letter. Slaying times are when real faith is created or deepened. Uh, God tests and affirms our faith. There are times when we can grow in faith. Such times allow the child of God to prove that he is not a mercenary professor of faith. Once more, the grim supposition of the text, if ever it was realized by anybody, it was realized by our Lord Jesus Christ. Our great covenant head knows to the full what we suffer. He's been there. And God did slay him. And glory be to his blessed name, he trusted God even while he was being slain. So here's the ultimate picture of this whole experience. Uh, Job again and again professes his innocency of anything that would be directly causing his trouble, but he does not hold to sinlessness. He again and again will confess his sin, and rightly so. Jesus had no sin to confess. And so there, there are a number of passages that it would be good to make a note of and do a little study on. Uh, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and Hebrews 12. Uh, just to take a quick glance at a couple of those, uh, let's go to uh, Isaiah 53, verse 11. A part of what sustained Jesus as he trusted Jesus, he's being He's going straight to the cross. What sustained him? And he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So as Jesus was going to the cross and 
willingly laying down his life, uh, he does so with a confidence that God is going to bring an incredible harvest from it. And we don't have to see it, but we must be in the same... What, what's at stake here? Uh, there's a lot on my plate. There's a lot I don't understand. But I need to go back with the Apostle Paul. All the things that have happened to me have happened for the furtherance of the gospel. Uh, the, the gospel being seen is at stake, as well as my sanctification and all of that. And then in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, wherefore seeing, first starting with verse 1, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. One, one of the things, the great things that will sustain us and encourage us and put some spiritual backbone in us when we are, as it were, being slain, uh, our dreams, our hopes, or whatever, uh, God has sovereignly brought or allowed something on our plate, and it is it just uh, it's overwhelming. Well, can we imagine how small that is compared to what Jesus was facing? The author and finisher of our faith headed straight to the cross and knew he was going there, and at one point, the agony is sweat drops of blood if there's any other way. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. And the words that comes from the cross. Uh, Jesus was all in to honoring his father. And uh, again, Jesus is our model. It's good to look at Job. It's good to be reminded that even the best of the Lord's servants are frail. And, and we, we need to be careful about which verses we, we underline and run to. Uh, running to this one, though he slay me, I will trust him. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, we're not called upon to, to, to pretend to be more spiritual than we are. Uh, we're not to excuse our frailty, but neither are we to be condemned by our frailty. We overcome all of that by continuing to go back and look at Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So, um, you know, a lot of Christians in the world in, in, during the entirety of our lifetime have experienced this on levels that we can't comprehend. They live in extreme poverty, they live in extreme persecution, and, and all the rest. While we have our issues, but we've been blessed, incredibly blessed. But, uh, so it's, it's good for us to look at this agony that Job has been going through and to see the tenacity of holding fast to faith. And so staying in the word of God is the only thing that's going to empower us in that. In verse 18 it says, I will defend my own ways before him. I know that I shall be vindicated. He started from the get-go. God himself said he's, he's, he's blameless, he's an upright man. And uh, again, he, it's not arrogant or pride to rejoice in a clear conscience and to seek to maintain a clear conscience. Um, here's a statement. As you look at Job in all of this, Job was a remarkable, is a remarkable example of a man who will not forfeit what he knows to be true in the midst of the storm. So here is Job being beaten down, beaten down, beaten down. 
by well-meaning friends. But he holds fast to his integrity. Uh, now, at the other side of this, to keep in mind, what is one of the things that God does, according to Hebrews 12, verse 25 through 29? He shakes the things that can be shaken so that the things that cannot be shaken remain. God does a sifting and a sorting. And he did that with Peter, right? And, and Jesus said, Satan is going to sift you, but I prayed for you. And so we need to keep in mind this is a war zone. We already know that for Job, Satan is out to win his bet. He's betting everything on that the only reason that Job worships God is because God has blessed him. So take away all the blessings, he'll curse you. So uh, I don't believe that these three men recognized that they could have been tools of the evil one. I'm not going to judge their hearts dogmatically, but I'm going to suggest that that's certainly possible. And it's certainly possible in our world that well-meaning people are being used of the evil one to bring about attacks and, uh, and with partiality, uh, uh, accusations and, and scrutiny that they would not apply to themselves or maybe on some occasion that we've not applied to others. I mean, that we have applied to others, but we're not applying to ourselves. But he wouldn't forfeit what he knew was true in the midst of the storm. So in verse 26 it says, You write bitter things against me. You make me inherit the iniquities of my youth. Uh, so what do we see here? Job does not deny that he's had sin in his life. Uh, he's not saying I'm, I'm a sinless person. But he goes on to say, if, if now I hold my tongue, I perish. Uh, if, if all you have is your integrity and the truth of that, and, and people don't, do not want you to say that or want to rip you apart from it, what do you have left? So it's a very sacred thing to be able to have integrity before God that doesn't waver no matter the accusation. And we see this from a lot of the Christian martyrs throughout the centuries. They are attacked from every angle, and yet they, they tenaciously hold to the gospel. All right, in verse 20 through 27, um, here it seems that, that Job is asking God to tell him if sin is indeed the cause of his suffering. Verse 20, only two things do not do to me. Then I will not hide myself from you. Withdraw your hand far from me and let me and let not the dread of you make me afraid. Then call and I will answer or let me speak. Then you respond to me. How many of my iniquities and sins how many are my iniquities and sins? Uh, that's not a question as if there are none. He's, he's aware that there's many. Make me know my transgression and my sin. Why do you hide my, your face and regard me as your enemy? Will you frighten a leaf driven to and fro? Will you pursue dry stubble? For you write bitter things against me, and you make me inherit the iniquities of my youth. You put my feet in stocks and watch closely all my paths. And you set a limit for the soles of my feet. And some, some of this, it seems like as he's talking to the, these guys, he's talking to the Lord. Um, but no, we know that earlier Job had told God that he just wanted to be left alone. Job 7, 16. Uh, he now shows that really this is more of a feeling, but not something 
he really wanted. Uh, I believe that Job understood that God was, in fact, sustaining him. Uh, he feels like God is hiding from him. Uh, this is what he th thinks. This is what he feels. He can't understand it. Uh, he says, let, the dread of, let not the dread of you make me afraid. Um, he, he's wanting to be restored in his communion with the Lord. Um, his fear here may not be a proper fear. It may be more of a dread rather than of a holy respect. He may be teetering with and embracing something of the idea that, you know, God is in fact trying to hurt me. I think if we were in Job's shoes, we would wonder that. So I'm not going to look down my nose at him. So Job is holding to his innocence, not his sinlessness, but that there's no special sin that's caused his suffering. At the same time, he says, uh, basically, I'm a sinner, and he wants to be shown his iniquities. This sounds a little bit like Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Uh, it, it's more in a more positive tone from the psalmist, but I believe that's the essence of what Job is crying out for. And it's certainly a prayer that should often be upon our hearts. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my anxieties. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In verse 24, why do you hide your face and regard me as your enemy? See, again, we see this back and forth again and again um, with Job. And, um, and he, then he says, will you frighten a leaf? driven to and fro. And Spurgeon, who has a great way with words and understanding things, has, a, I think, a good comment there. It is a common figure he uses, that of a leaf driven to and fro. Strong gust of winds, it may be in the autumn when the leaves hang but lightly on the trees and send them falling in showers around us, quite helpless to stay on their own course, fluttering in the air to and fro like winged birds that cannot steer themselves, but are guided by every fitful blast that blows upon them. At last, they sink to the mire to be trodden down and forgotten. To them, Job likens himself, a helpless, hopeless, worthless, weak, despised, and perishing thing. So you can take that and really beat yourself up and be condemned and just try to forget God. Or you can say, as Spurgeon follows up to say, Oh, my brethren, what a great blessing it is to be shown our own weakness. For then we see how much we need the Lord and how precious he is. To empty the sinner of his folly and his vanity and conceit is no, mat no small matter. <laughs> uh, that's a daily battle. Uh, we, and maybe this is un unwittingly, maybe this is what Job's friends were trying to do. To empty Job of his folly, his vanity, and conceit, which they felt he had. And the proof of it is, look what has happened to you. God is obviously chastening you. But that was not the case. So, in verse 26, you write bitter things against me. The suggestion has been made that God is a doctor writing a prescription of bitter medicine or a judge 
prescribing bitter punishment or recording Job's bitter crimes. The writing is the decree allocating bitter things to Job. Again, Job is, again, confessing his, the agony of his soul. Is God, in fact, trying to beat him up, throw him down, cast him aside? No. But when you get to the end of the way, you find out that this righteous man, this man who is righteous, and, and God said he was righteous. God, this whole process humbles Job, and he repents with a deep repentance when we get to the end of the way. Um, in verse 28, man decays like a rotten thing, like a garment that is a moth is moth eaten. Uh, and there is, is there's it's one thing for Zophar and the friends to make these sort of accusations about Job. He was living in the they were talking about it. And we could say that they were talking about the depravity of man. And they had their ideas about how depraved Job was. Well, Job was experiencing it. He was not just talking about it. He was in the middle of the experience. And you, you can't stop with chapter 13. You have to keep plodding on before till we get to and see. And we're blessed that we're able to plod through these difficult chapters knowing that there is high significance, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And when you see Job finally humbled and broken and then restored, that's God's pattern for each of us. Uh, he chastens because he loves, and he chastens because he's going to uh, create a testimony in and through our lives that's going to be a blessing to someone. 